Hello, and welcome to our awesome course, Introduction to Computational Physics. My name is Sasha Chekhovskoy, and I will be your instructor for this course. Our course uh, will be asynchronous. That is, I'm going to be pre-recording all of the lectures and make them available on YouTube. Uh, we will also have a synchronous component to the course, uh, which uh, is office slash hackathon hours. Uh, this component takes place at 11 a.m. Uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, and uh, it is taking place over Zoom, so you can uh, get access to it uh, by looking it up on Canvas, where this link uh, has been posted. Uh, this is the uh, place on Canvas where you can find all this information. Uh, this is where all the course uh, uh, paperwork goes in electronic form, such as slides of the lectures, uh, links to the videos, such as this one, uh, examples, assignments, uh, midterms, uh, and so on. And I would like to express enormous gratitude and special thanks to Christian Han and Yuram Lipik who have provided uh, their materials uh, for the course. Uh, they taught it in the previous years. So here's the syllabus. Uh, the book that we're going to be following is Giordano and Nekoshini, uh, Computational Physics. It's a really nice and uh, physics-oriented book uh, with really clear explanations of the numerical methods and how they help you to solve practical problems in computational physics. Uh, we will start with the four lectures uh, devoted to the description of the Linux system, uh, a little bit of plotting uh, using Python and GNUplot, uh, and then we're going to move on to uh, the nuts and bolts of the C language, such as variables, input-output, arrays, uh, pointers, functions, uh, structures, uh, and uh, compilation and uh, linking. So it actually does go into C in quite a bit of detail. So hopefully you will enjoy that. Uh, this is the full syllabus. It's subject to change. I'm going to try to brush it up uh, to make it clear uh, what is the lecture uh, that is posted in that day and what is it that you need to read for that day. So uh, thanks for your comments uh, during the office hours uh, earlier. And I will try to improve that in accordance to your suggestions. Uh, the grading scheme is really important. Uh, homework weighs about half of the grade, 50%, uh, and I will be posting homeworks regularly uh, on syllabus and uh, on Canvas. Uh, the midterm weighs about one-fifth, so it's 20%, uh, and uh, we will take one of the days off so that you can focus on the midterm uh, instead of uh, having the office hours. But that doesn't mean that you will only have one day to um, work on the midterm. Uh, I'm going to try to give you an entire week, including one of the weekends, so you can pick and choose the time that works best for you uh, so that you are not under any time pressure. There is no time limit on the exam. You can work for as long or as little as you wish. Uh, the only ask of you is please work on it independently. Uh, you can use any materials online or in the books, but please uh, do not uh, copy and paste the code anywhere from the internet. Uh, please type it out on your own. I would like to see your own code, your own uh, coding ability. Uh, finally, the final project uh, is uh, one where you would team up with uh, another student from the class and you will work in pairs on the final project. You, as a pair, come up with uh, a bunch of ideas that you're interested in looking at, uh, come to me, and we will uh, discuss and see what sort of uh, problems you could solve uh, such that it would be interesting and relevant uh, to your interests. So let's get started. Uh, what is Linux and what is C and why are we focusing so much on these two? Well, Linux is because it's a free operating system. Uh, it's royalty free, uh, you don't have to pay anyone to install it, and it's great because if you have a big supercomputer with a lot of nodes, uh, basically computer is made out of little little computers, each of which is a node and they connected by network, we're going to be talking more about it later, 
uh, you would have to pay a lot of royalties to install operating system on each of these nodes. And the Linux is free. That's why all supercomputers use Linux. Uh, it's as good as any other operating system uh, for the purposes of uh, high performance computing. And by now, it could be as good uh, for your everyday use uh, as a laptop uh, system. We will not be covering it in too many details, but we will give you enough for you to be able to feel comfortable in the Linux shell. Um, and C, why is it C language? Why not Python? Wait, well, Python is good. You may have heard it's really nice and intuitive, but it's slow. If you actually want to create your own numerical algorithm, something that hasn't been done before, then you cannot rely on Python. You can use Python to prototype it, but C is the language that you will go to uh, to implement that and maybe then call uh, this new algorithm from inside Python. So that's why we'll focus on C. Uh, this is a very fast compile language. It's very close to hardware. It allows you to control uh, the locations of everything in memory. Uh, and uh, it is basically replacing Fortran for high performance computing. Uh, C and C++ is what is used to create operating systems uh, like uh, Linux and Android. So it's a really good language to know. Uh, so uh, where is the supercomputer? Well, it is right here. It's called Quest. Uh, we have one on our campus. Uh, it actually is a rather big supercomputer that uh, contains uh, different parts uh, built at different times and uh, therefore it has different types of nodes. But what's important for you right now is that it's basically a bunch of nodes that are uh, connected by the network. Um, and uh, you can access them and uh, ask them to do something good and useful for you. Uh, so this is where you can perform all of your work. So even if you have an iPad, as long as you have access to the supercomputer, you can do all the problem sets. You can do all the computations over uh, there. If you have any questions how to do that, ask me. Um, but as an alternative, I'm also recommending that you will install Linux uh, and C compiler on your own computer so that you actually can do uh, all of the work on your own laptop once you leave Northwestern you will be equipped to do that independent of whether you have a supercomputer access at the time. And that's my goal. I want you to be able to do everything that you like. Uh, so this week, we're going to start out with the Linux Unix basics of the shell, which is kind of the environment through which you interact uh, with the system. Uh, we're going to briefly cover an editor Emacs, although you can use any editor you like, it's just Emacs is packaged with Linux, and so uh, you might want to know how to do that because it's a, a pretty nice, uh, powerful editor. Uh, we're going to be discussing compilation of C programs with uh, the GNU compiler, or GCC for short, and we're going to be discussing these two, uh, Python and GNUplot, for plotting. Uh, Python is a more powerful uh, system, very flexible, that allows you to perform advanced uh, data analysis and plotting that look plots that look really great. And GNU plot uh, allows you to create great looking plots, but it's less flexible, but much quicker. Uh, so we will see what the pros and cons of those both systems uh, are. Um, I almost always use Python, but I thought I will cover GNU plot because it's popular um, among some circles. So how do you get started? We already discussed a lot of this uh, during the office hours uh, and the hackathon session, so I will not go into details, but this is what I recommend uh, for you to install if you would like to uh, future-proof your laptop so that you could do most of the uh, homeworks and uh, your work on your laptop without having to go to a supercomputer. So obviously you would like to install an editor. Uh, or in environment where you can do the code development. And uh, one choice could be Visual Studio or Studio Code. Visual Studio is a heavier environment, but it has many more functions. Studio Code has many of the same functions, but a little bit more clunky, a little bit more modular, a little bit le less um, seamless. Uh, on the other hand, Studio Code is uh, open source, free, and multi-platform. So you can install Studio Code on Linux machine or on Windows machine or on the Mac machine. Uh, Visual Studio, as far as I know, uh, doesn't exist for Linux, but you can install a Windows version, which is the most powerful. And I think you might even have one uh, for a Mac. There is a special student version uh, for Visual Studio, which you can get uh, for free. 
Uh, in Windows 10, there is no Linux by default, but actually in recent years they have built a module that basically bakes Linux inside, very close to the Windows core. Uh, this is called Windows Subsystem for Linux, or WSL for short. Uh, by now, there are two versions of it, WSL 1 version 1 and WSL version 2. I recommend you go with WSL version 2 if your system supports it. It's more powerful than the first version uh, and it basically allows you to have Linux built into Windows. Really, really uh, useful. I use the first version and it works great for me. Uh, uh, super, um, uh, super convenient that I can have both Linux and Windows uh, sitting on the same system. And this actually is what allows me um, to feel like working in Windows is actually livable. That's because I have Linux inside of it. Uh, I also recommend that you install Python, uh, which is the plotting tools, um, and uh, Anaconda distribution uh, is a quite popular way of downloading uh, Python with a really useful uh, user-friendly package manager where you can uh, tell it to install this or that package, it will go automatically figure out what it is and download and install for you. So as we discussed, another way of uh, uh, doing programming and code development is uh, instead of doing it on your laptop, you can do it on a supercomputer. Uh, it is a little bit less um, uh, visually intuitive because the editors are not as flashy. There might be network delay, especially if you're somewhere in Europe uh, or in China, Hong Kong, uh, uh, you know, on the other end of the world, uh, there is time lag. So it might be uh, attractive to have something on uh, your local machine uh, that is completely independent of the network connection the flaking news of the internet. If so, then stick with the first three items. Uh, these items are if you are ready to test your code out uh, on, you know, a bigger machine, which is a supercomputer, or if your laptop doesn't allow you to do code development, or if you just want to get a sense for how is it to uh, work with a supercomputer. So for all these use cases, uh, you can uh, log in to quest.northwestern.edu. Uh, on a Mac, uh, all you have to do is type this. Uh, maybe you will have to add your username uh, at uh, followed by the address. We're going to discuss this in more detail later. So suppose you logged into a supercomputer uh, or you fired up your Linux uh, window and what you are looking at is actually called the shell. That is what you see. Um, that is the program into which you can type the characters. So that is your interface, your eyes and ears uh, into uh, the world of Linux. And uh, you talk to it through commands. The most common shell is bash. It stands for born again shell. And uh, we will just focus on this because I have been using it. I know it's the best, it, the, it best. And uh, you know, it's rather popular. It's typical to have bash as the default shell on many supercomputers. And uh, the language that this shell understands is typically referred to as shell scripting. We won't go too much into details, although we will use a little bit of shell scripting uh, here and there. If you're interested, let me know. I can give you a few nifty examples of how the use of shell scripting can be used, for instance, for batch rename of a bunch of files. You don't have to go in and manually rename each of them. It can be really, really powerful. Uh, so let's try and take a look at some examples of how to use bash commands. For instance, let's try and write the hello world program using bash. Um, what happens here is we're going to run a bash command uh, right here, which says echo, uh, open quote, hello, comma, world, uh, close quote. And maybe there was an exclamation point. Yes, there was an exclamation point. And oh, the output here is hello, world. So this is a very simple command because the echo is simply printing out on the screen whatever follows uh, the command itself. Uh, directories, well of course uh, unless you're using uh, an iOS uh, you actually have access to a directory tree so you can have a kind of a folder uh, which is what directory is and inside of it there could be a bunch of files 
So directories allow you to organize files such that you can easily find uh, things that are kind of grouped together by topic. You know, so problem set one, that would be a folder perhaps. Um, so um, although in Windows it's called folders, on Linux it's referred to as directories, although by now I think the two terms are uh, interchangeable in a colloquial language. Um, so home is a special folder uh, or directory. It's your landing page equivalent of a directory in the Linux system. That's where all of your personal stuff goes. Um, so that's the place where you end up when you just logged into the cluster. Um, and uh, you have typically full control over uh, what directories you create uh, in your in your home. Uh, other users typically don't have access to your home directory, so this is where you put you, all of your personal stuff uh, that you don't want others to see. Um, please know that on many supercomputers, um, if your code produces massive and massive amounts of data, like terabytes of data, you don't want to be putting it into your home directory. You want to go into a special place that is meant for that. Typically, it's called Scratch. We're not going to worry about it right now because we're not going to be creating massive amounts of data, but just uh, for the future, uh, when you do get to that, keep that in mind. Look up where is Scratch folder, and they will tell you Scratch is sitting over there. So how do we jump between the different directories? Well, uh, one of them is PWD. Uh, it is present working directory. That's the directory where you're sitting in, uh, but because you don't know where you are, uh, this is basically a way for you to find out where I am. It's kind of the GPS uh, of, the, um, of the file system. Uh, the current directory has a shortcut uh, you can always refer to the current directory as dot. If you want to list the contents of uh, the current directory, you type ls. Uh, if you want to uh, list a different one, you will have to put its name after ls. We're going to see that later. If you want to change directories, uh, you use cd command. cd, and then you give it the directory into which you want to change. Uh, so as uh, we saw previously, directory structures are like trees, so uh, you can specify the different levels of your tree structure uh, and hop uh, down the directory tree. You can also go back up the directory tree uh, by uh, using dot dot, which will be the parent directory one level above. Uh, so each dot dot takes you one level higher. And finally, of course, you need to know how to create or destroy directories. And for these, you have makedir and rmdir commands. So let's see how it works. So here is an example. Uh, we're going to create two directories, one sitting inside of another, inside of your home directory. Uh, we will go all the way down to the innermost uh, directory, then going to, back, going to go back up, and then we're going to delete both of these directories. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So first, let's check out where we are currently located. Uh, then let us create foo. Let us create subdirectory of foo that is called bar. Uh, then let's go and change our directory into foo bar. Uh, and then let us make sure that we actually are sitting in that. And PWD shows the full path, uh, the root directory, and then all the directories and subdirectories in the directory tree. Then let's go back up, dot dot slash dot dot means we're hopping once and twice up. So we're going to get out of foobar into the directory of where we created those two. Uh, and then we're going to rem remove the innermost directory, foo slash bar. And then we're going to remove the foo directory. Uh, we're going to make sure that we're still where we intended to be and we're done. I hope that was clear. Let me know if not. So symbolic links are super, super nice. Uh, why is that? It's kind of a shortcut to go where you want to go. Uh, we have a project space that is shared among all of us uh, within this course, and it's sitting in slash project slash E20271, where E20271 is uh, the name of our allocation on the Quest supercomputer. 
So it's maybe really hard to memorize one extra thing, E20271, and also this project slash beforehand, uh, before it. So what we can do, we can create a uh, symbolic link. And this is done uh, through ln minus s command. ln stands for link, and the minus s is so called a switch, which tells it to please create a symbolic link. And what we're going to do here is we're going to create a soft link uh, to projects E20271. And then after that, we're going to put down the name. Uh, by which we want the symbolic link to be known. So uh, now uh, we are going to be able to change instead of uh, this path, projects E20271, you can simply refer to that as Fizz352. Actually, it's not Fizz, it's just PHY. Uh, once we go into that directory, uh, you can uh, uh, print the full path and you see that the full path looks as if we are sitting in the real physical directory phi 352 which doesn't really exist it's just a soft link so if we get out from inside of the symbolic link we're going to be in the directory where the symbolic link is not uh, just one level above the directory to which the symbolic link points Okay, we now know how to work with directories. So let us now see how we can arrange the files between the directories. And one of the most important commands is CP that stands, as you may have guessed, for copy. If you want to copy an entire directory tree, you can use minus R switch in order to uh, copy directories as a whole with all of their contents, uh, or in other words, recursively. You can also view the files, um, uh, which is cat. Don't confuse it with dog. There's actually no dog command under Linux, unfortunately. Um, so cat followed by the file name will blur out the entire file contents. And if the file contents are 100 pages, you're going to have to be patiently sitting there and waiting until the terminal scrolls through all of these 100 pages. Uh, if you want to be uh, able to uh, page down through uh, the file contents, uh, then less is better. Um, if you type less followed by the file name, uh, what that is is it's going to show you the first page of the file name of the file contents. If you press space bar or down, you're going to be able to go to the subsequent subsequent pages, or you can go uh, back up. In order to get out of it, you need to press Q to quit. Uh, finally, really important one is remove the file uh, is done through the rm uh, command. Uh, so you type rm file name and the file will be removed. It also works on directories, um, which are actually just another type of file. But in order to remove a directory, you might need to add a switch to that, uh, which you will discover when you try to delete it, and then you will Google how do you remove a directory. It will tell you. So let's take a look at a few examples. So suppose that we would like to uh, copy a file, the standard file um, that we will see. It's standard input-output.h. It's a header file that's used in C everywhere. Um, and we're going to copy it into the current directory. We're going to be able to see uh, how the guts of the file look like, and this is what you will see. It will be the first page of this file. See the name of the file is here at the bottom. Uh, and then we're going to be able to get out of the screen by pressing Q. And uh, after we're done, we're going to be able to remove uh, this file uh, copy that we created in our home directory. Um, so now let us uh, try and uh, run a file that is executable. All of these commands actually were executables and we didn't know where they were located. We just typed the name and they just magically were run. It's because the operating system knew where these files are or where to look for them. So um, if you were to create your own executable, how, how would the system know where to look for that? So one way is you're going to be able to give the system the 
full path uh, to the executable. So let's take a look at how that works. So for instance, over here, we can create a directory called foo. Uh, we're going to copy an executable from the uh, standard location of bin uh, into uh, that directory foo. Uh, and uh, then we're going to call it in something, something else. Like instead of host name, we're going to call it uh, differently, uh, my host name. So my host name is a file that's identical to host name, um, but it's located inside of a foo subdirectory that we created. So let's now um, run it. And uh, this is a problem that we're going to run into, that our bash will complain that my host name is not found. So what can we do? Well, uh, we can give it a full path and then uh, the system will know where it is located and it will actually print out the host name or the name on the of the node on which you are currently logged in. Uh, you can also provide a relative path dot slash my host name and that will also work. The reason why Linux system doesn't allow you to run a, a, an executable that is sitting right there in your local directory by typing its name is that of security. Because suppose that somebody wanted to trick you into running a malicious executable. I would call it ls and I would put it in your local directory. So the next time you type ls to view the contents of your current directory, you would inadvertently run the bad infected executable. In order to avoid that, you need to be specific to the system that you actually intend to run uh, a, an executable that is sitting in the current directory. So you would have to run dot slash ls like here. Uh, dot slash my host name. Just here, the executable is called differently. Uh, or you would have to provide the full path. There are other ways of uh, allowing you to run executables which are located in non standard locations. And that is if you add them to the path variable, environment variable. So the system has a, a repository of variables. Uh, which make up its environment of variables, and one of them is called path. So now let's talk about all of this variable thing in Linux. So environment, environment variables, uh, these are the variables that uh, Bash uses to enrich your environment, to provide some sort of long-term memory uh, of where things are, how things are supposed to be eaten, and so on. Um, so home for instance is a variable uh, and uh, they have a default value that is pre-assigned by the shell when you log in to point to your home directory location. You can view all of the environmental variables that are defined for your session by typing env short for environment and when you do that over here you will see you know variable name equal blah and so on and this is just the beginning they could be you know 100 lines or a few hundred lines in there depending on how busy the environment is uh, so the important variable that we would like to understand is um, um, is home but um, how do I check the value of the variable so I uh, can do that by prepending a dollar sign in front of the variable name. For instance, echo home uh, will print out the path to your home directory. You can create new variables or you can modify existing variables. So in order to uh, do that, you will have to start your command with the export uh, command. Uh, and you do not use dollar signs in this case. So here you would, for instance, have to Right, export foo equals to bar in quotes. That means that you've created a environment variable called foo whose value is bar. And now you can uh, view the value that foo variable was assigned to and find that 
it is equal to bar. So far, so good, right? So how do we run an executable that is located who knows where? You don't want to remember that path. You installed a new piece of software. It's sitting somewhere in a non-standard way, uh, non-standard location, and you don't want to remember the full path to that executable. So what you can do is you add the subdirectory that you created and into which you placed the executable to the path variable. Path is a so-called list variable. Um, it is a list through which uh, Bash goes in order to see which locations it needs to look into. Uh, and uh, the locations are separated by columns. So if you uh, print out the value of path, you will see there will be the first path, uh, then there will be a column separating from the next path and so on and so forth. So in order to um, add another variable to the path, what you will do is you will write export path equals uh, the original path with all the different values in the list separated by columns plus the column uh, that separates the new um, location that you would like to add uh, to the list and then you are actually adding that location itself and once you uh, print out the value of the path you will see at the very end uh, the presence of the new location that you have added. So there is also another path that is called the library path and uh, it's named a little bit longer LD library path. This is uh, used to find not executables but libraries and libraries are really useful they're almost like executables but these are the executables that you absorb inside of your program so it's kind of compiled code available on demand and uh, uh, you oftentimes use libraries there are libraries for uh, you know special functions and so on uh, libraries for math functions uh, like uh, there is a GSL FFT MPI and so on and so you use this path to tell the system where it needs to look for those libraries that you want to use. Another very important uh, concept is input and output. And in particular, in Linux, input and output are um, possible to be redirected. So uh, typically the output is the screen of the terminal. So if I write something to the terminal, then it appears um, you know in the window uh, but sometimes you would like to save the output so you would like to redirect it from the screen onto the file so that then you can save this file print this file share this file whatever you want uh, this is also quite useful if you don't want your program to worry about opening a specific file all you can do is just uh, run the program uh, and then uh, redirect its output to whatever file you want so how do you do that you use greater than signs or one or two of them in a row. Uh, so one means that I'm going to create a new file. Uh, if the file exists, I'm going to wipe out its contents and then uh, redirect the output into this newly created or newly wiped file. And two greater than signs means that if the file already exists, I'm going to append to the end of the file. And if it doesn't exist, I'm going to create a new one. So uh, these are the two uh, redirections of output. Similarly, you can redirect the input um, so that you can read not from the terminal, but from some other file, uh, which is useful if you want to copy one file into the other, then you read from the terminal. Uh, but if the terminal is re redirected to be a file, uh, then you actually will be reading from a file. So let's take a look at uh, how that works in practice. So here is an example. Uh, where we going to echo bar into fudo dat, uh, and then we're going to cat, uh, or uh, we're going to uh, print out the contents, and we're going to be uh, printing out the contents of the file foo. Uh, so this is uh, going to give us bar. All right. So uh, bar um, was print it onto the screen so echo bar prints it onto the screen uh, but because we are redirecting the output the screen into a file what would go into the screen will actually go into this file uh, and then 
uh, if we want to read from the file. So cat without any arguments would just read from the standard input, but we are redirecting the standard input to be uh, read from a file. And so that's why we're getting back the bar, the contents of that file. Um, what you can also do is you can kind of create a, a daisy chains of uh, different commands where command number one outputs something that is used as input into the other command and then that one outputs something else and that can be piped into uh, the uh, third command and so on. So here is an example of how you uh, can um, print out foo.dat file contents onto the screen and then you can pipe the output, the standard output, as input into the next command, in this case rev. And what rev does, it flips the order of the characters. And so you're going to get uh, out here uh, rab, which is the reverse of bar. Hope that makes sense. This is my favorite one. Uh, this is something that I wish Windows had. Maybe it has by now, but Linux has had it for ages. I remember I was still in college, which was uh, in the 1990s, and Linux already had that. And I was so fascinated, and it keeps fascinating me to this day. So you can run a command in the background so that uh, it's not going to be taken over your terminal, which is super useful if, uh, let's say, I want to run a, a graphical interface software. So uh, I'm sitting in terminal and I say, please start my editor. And uh, instead of the editor starting, popping up a window and then taking over the terminal, uh, if you append ampersand sign at the end of the command, uh, then the editor will start, the window will pop up, and you will get back access to terminal. That's because the editor will be backgrounded. It will not be uh, sitting in the foreground, therefore taking control over the terminal, uh, it will be sitting in the background, and so the terminal will be unaffected. You will get the control back to that. So that is precisely uh, what is described here. Um, ooh, this is fantastic as well. Windows uses that, but um, Linux is much more powerful here. Uh, you can uh, use wildcard matches. If you want to uh, let's say you have a series of photographs and you would like to refer to all of them at once. You don't want to list all of them in the command line. You can say uh, photo star uh, will match all of the photographs that start with photo and let's say followed by numbers or combination of characters, anything like this star stands for all of them. Um, so example here is we would like to list all of the files sitting in uh, the include directory uh, that end in dot h and that start with L, uh, which typically refers to as library, right? L is library. So L star dot H is all the files that start with L and end in dot H. And these are all of these uh, files. So super, super useful. Uh, you can immediately filter out a lot of files like that without breaking a sweat. Um, please be very careful because wildcards can be wild. And if you, let's say, want to say, I would like to uh, remove all the files that start with X. So you type rmx star, but there are so many ways it can go wrong. You can accidentally drop the X and just type rm star, and then it won't ask you sometimes and just remove all the files in the current directory so you will lose all of your work. Uh, or you can type rmx space star accidentally. And what it will try to do, it will try to ram a file named x, it won't find it, and then it will remove all the files that match the star, which is all the files. So be very careful. If I am working with data that I know I cannot easily reproduce, I'm working with the code, I never ever use rm. What I do is I move the files I don't want elsewhere. I do mv uh, x star, into a new location and then I remove the files at that new location. So that is a safer way of operating and moreover I use version control that I mentioned um, during the office hours, uh, git versioning system, uh, which allows you to avoid uh, the snafus because you will have saved your work previously. 
there are a lot of tricks uh, in order to make working with the command line faster, save you type strokes, uh, avoid developing carpal tunnel. Um, for example, if you want to jump between the beginning and the end of the line, you can try uh, using home and end. Sometimes it doesn't work. In this case, control A and control E will take you to the beginning and to the end of the line. Uh, you can also cut and paste the line. Uh, control K is the cut and control Y will be the paste. Uh, if you want to go back to the previous command, all you have to do is type up and you will go back to the previous command. You keep pressing up to go back more and more and more. If you want to go back to a command that was a long time ago, but uh, it started with something specific that you remember, you can type uh, exclamation point followed by a few first few characters of the command and it will find that command and will repeat it. For instance, if you type hello world, echo hello world, and then uh, you would like to um, repeat that command, you will type exclamation point E, and it will repeat the last command that started with E, which was precisely this one. There are other tricks. For instance, you can type control R, reverse search, and type the command, start typing the command, will show you the last match. This, in fact, is what I prefer because I have control over how many characters I type and I can stop typing once the command that I want actually shows up, so I can preview it uh, before running it. Whereas with exclamation point, it just runs the last command and might not be the one if you didn't type enough characters and it matches uh, a later command that I really didn't really want. Man doesn't stand for man, it stands for manual. And please look up what this means if you have never seen this. Uh, it's something that should be bleeped out. So if you want to understand how to use a command that comes with Linux, or if you install later, uh, you don't have to go onto the web and look it up. Uh, you can type man manual, followed by the name of the command, and it will show you how to use it. Um, you can use it on Linux tools. You can also use it on C command as well, because all the manuals are kind of uh, kept in a centralized location. So. Uh, for instance, if you're interested in understanding how to use this really powerful search command, uh, grep, uh, then you just type man grep and it will show you how to use uh, grep. Uh, grep, haha. <laughs> well, let's take a look at how to use this command. Uh, you can go back and read the manual, uh, but this is one example of a tool that can simplify your life enormously and I wish Windows had it. Maybe it has it by now, but honestly who wants to wait for that when you can have full Linux set of commands at your disposal already. So uh, for instance grep prints out all the lines in the file that contain a certain pattern you're looking for. Uh, it could be a word or a string uh, or maybe a particular character you're searching for. If you want to find foo, for instance, in all the system files, who would want to put foo in there? Well, you will see uh, how the developers were having fun. Uh, you type grab foo and then the location in the system. So in this case, it will be uh, usr include slash star. Uh, and it will show you all of these hits uh, that contain foo. Ooh, ps and kill. No, it doesn't mean postscript and kill. It means find processes that are currently running. Uh, PS stands for processes and kill doesn't necessarily mean what it means. Kill means send a signal to a process. Uh, so for instance, if you actually want to kill something, uh, meaning a process, you would want to type kill minus nine, where minus nine is a signal that means kill for real. Uh, followed by the process ID, and the process ID will come from the output of PS command that gives you uh, a listing of the currently running processes. So for instance, if you type uh, PS minus U followed by your user ID, you will get the list of the processes that you started here. Uh, this is SSH daemon, this is a, a bash, and uh, uh, I have no idea why sleep is in there, but I guess, you know, bash needs to sleep. Actually, this is a sleep command that just waits for a certain time. Uh, and then you will see that PS, uh, the command that you ran, is actually uh, listed among the commands. So if you would like to uh, delete 
uh, the steep command, which wasn't supposed to be there, right? No, well, of course, we started it just for us to be able to kill something. Uh, it's doing nothing there, it's sleeping. Uh, then you can type kill minus nine, the process ID of that command. Uh, let's see, is that, that that one? Nine, nine, four, two? Nine, nine, ah, sorry, one, nine, nine, four, two, exactly. So then uh, uh, you will see confirmation that uh, the sleep command uh, was killed and see we started with sleep 50, which means that uh, uh, the command would do nothing for 50 seconds. So if you wanted to reproduce that, you would type sleep 50 ampersand, which would put in the background. And then when you run PS, it would show you as sleep as one of the commands that's running in the background. Although it's doing nothing, it's still running. And then you would be able to kill that. So that's what you would do in order to uh, try to do uh, this uh, yourself. Uh, SSH and SCP. Ooh, now it's getting exciting. It's heating up. SSH, you may have heard about it. It's a secure shell. Uh, this is how you can securely connect uh, to a server. And SSH, ooh, when I was visiting China, SSH is a great way of bypassing the Great Chinese Firewall because you can use it as a poor man's VPN. Oh yeah. Um, so, or rather a proxy. So you can, for instance, set up a SOX proxy for those who have, may have heard about this uh, using SSH. Uh, you can also use it to access Quest uh, and uh, get this beautiful terminal window uh, where you type things in and they actually appear uh, uh, on the Quest supercomputer and then they travel back to you and they appear on your screen. Um, you can also use SCP, which is copy files over SSH, secure copy, SCP. SSH secure shell. Uh, so uh, you can copy things from your computer out to the um, Quest cluster, for instance, or you can copy them from Quest to your computer. And uh, the order of arguments is the same. Uh, you uh, type in SCP, uh, where to copy from, which could be a local file, and where to copy to. And the location of remote location, <laughs> the format of the remote location is username at the name of the remote host, colon, the remote path. Uh, if we want to copy it uh, from remote host to us, you just uh, swap the order of the arguments. So first you place the remote uh, location and then local location. Um, at Mac OS, uh, you have basically the same um, syntax. Uh, you can have different implementations. Now you can even install SSH, open SSH under Windows. So uh, you, in fact, don't have to install PuTTY anymore, um, but PuTTY is kind of a legacy way of uh, being able to SSH into uh, supercomputers or other computers. And it looks something like this. Uh, so uh, I still recommend that you install PuTTY because it's oftentimes useful, but there are other ways of uh, running SSH. You can open PowerShell or just Windows Shell and type SSH. If you have installed it, it will be there. Or you can uh, uh, install Linux inside of the Windows machine like we discussed in office hours using Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, and uh, you will be able to type SSH uh, because it's basically Linux. Editors, yes, this is where you will spend most of the time in your life if you are a scientist or a programmer. You're going to be editing the code, editing the papers, editing the reports. Editors are super, super important. And so, <laughs> although the purpose of editor is to put text into a file, how you put the text, how you indent it, uh, how is the syntax highlighted, and so on, what's the format, uh, is uh, really important. So that's what the editors do for us. Um, so, of course, you could do echo blah into the file, <laughs> it's pretty hard to type blah, 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 blah into the command line. So you actually want to have some sort of visual interface where you can choose where other characters go uh, instead of knowing a priori where they will go. So there are a few really popular editors um, in Linux, uh, which are VI and Emacs. Uh, VI is really powerful and makes it really hard to screw up. So it's really popular among Linux admins, sysadmins. And Emacs is a little bit more user-friendly uh, and super powerful. Emacs, in fact, is my favorite editor to write scientific 
papers in LaTeX. Uh, there are other ones that are m even more friendly, uh, kind of uh, uh, out of the box and have to figure out how to use them because VI, you have to read the manual. Emacs, eh, you'll probably have trouble getting in and out. Uh, or, yeah, I mean, I guess you can start it, but like quitting it, oh, it's a trouble. It's a lot of trouble. And VI is even more trouble. Uh, but Sublime and Studio Code are this really nice, uh, super user friendly editors that I highly recommend. They have really awesome syntax highlighting and maybe even more. They will give you contextual help uh, and so on. So try them out, uh, try a few and see which ones you prefer. Uh, we will often use Emacs in the examples. It doesn't mean that you have to use Emacs. It's just Emacs is installed on most of the supercomputers. So knowing how to use either VI or Emacs is really useful uh, because once you get access to a new supercomputer uh, and you don't know which editors are installed, these are the two that you try. And one of them will probably be installed over there. So this is a quick cheat sheet uh, not even cheat sheet, but just a combination, uh, like a list of the commands that you oftentimes need to use when you're using Emacs. Uh, more complete cheat sheet is available at this link. Uh, as we discussed, you can move to the beginning and the end of the line using Control A and Control E. If you want to delete uh, from the current location to the end of the line, uh, you type Control K. And if you want to paste something that you've saved, uh, you type control Y. Um, you can search, type in control S, not surprisingly perhaps. If you want to save a file, you have to press control and uh, type X followed by S. So that's a bit unusual. This is where uh, you have to stretch your fingers. If you want to open a new file, find file, uh, you type control X followed by control F. If you want to save the file, uh, you do control X, control W, uh, or control, uh, actually, I'm not sure what's the difference between write and save now. Hmm. Well, you will tell me. And uh, I've never used it, I think, in my life. And quitting is as easy as control X, control C. Uh, so uh, take a look here, and we're going to have a few examples in the next slides. Um, before we get there, let's take a look at scripts because script is a file with a bunch of commands in there if you don't want to remember the order of the commands or the names of these commands um, it's pretty useful to be able to put them in one single executable file and just run that one file and that is called a script uh, so uh, typically uh, you start the file by pronouncing to uh, the operating system what sort of script it is. And you start it with uh, this weird pound sign exclamation point, followed by the location of the executable, um, the script interpreter. Um, so uh, this tells the um, operating system to execute bash for interpreting uh, this file. And here, for instance, uh, all we will do is we will ask it to print out hello world. And bingo, all of this is Emacs. So this is how you use the editor. You use it to create and edit files. Uh, so if it's a text file, that's great, but we would like to actually be able to run it. So how do you run or execute it? Although I don't like the word execute, I prefer run. So if you uh, do source followed by the name of the script, it will actually uh, run the script. Or you can make the file be executable, uh, tell the operating system that, ha, huh, this is actually an executable file. And you do that by typing chmod plus x followed by the file name. Uh, then you will be able to run it by typing um, dot slash uh, the name of the script and you're going to get the output that you expected. Uh, you can use scripts for doing complicated manipulations, copying files, renaming files, and so on. Um, 
it's actually quite powerful and a lot of things you can do using bash a lot of things you can do in c it's just the scripts are kind of focused on operating files as a whole uh, and c is maybe on how to create the details of the files so to say um, so you can think of uh, bash scripting as a precursor of uh, the more popular and widespread uh, scripting languages like python currently um, we won't go into bash scripting in detail, but if you're looking for something, you can always Google it. And oftentimes, websites such as Stack Exchange uh, will uh, give you an answer of how to do this or that. For instance, you can loop over files uh, and uh, you can use a for loop structure in a bash script. We will, however, use Python for plotting and data analysis, and uh, more on this is coming. But before that, let's talk about C language. This is the workhorse of uh, computational physics. Uh, all of my supercomputer simulations, of which I guess I should show you some movies to convince you that computational physics is actually uh, real, you know, it can produce really cool movies. Which means that it's as real as it gets. It's written uh, in C. GNU-C is uh, the standard compiler suite um, and the command looks like GCC. Um, in order to compile the code in Linux, um, you don't press a button and it compiles. Linux doesn't make it easy for you. You have to fight for it. Um, so this is different than integrated uh, development environments or IDEs like Visual Studio you actually have to use the shell. So I'm not saying that the shell is better than Visual Studio. I'm not saying you have to use the shell, but I want to make sure that you know how to use the shell if you have to, and you will decide which one you prefer. In my experience, once you know how to use the shell, uh, you use it for installing big software packages on Linux and supercomputers and so on. But if you develop the code, you're going to go back to your ID, which highlights everything really prettily, and where you don't have to think what to type in the command line to run the code, just press the button. So for the development, I use Visual Studio or Xcode, it's analog on, on Windows, or uh, Visual Studio Code, whatever you, you want, any integrated development environment. And then once you've figured out that your code doesn't have bugs, it's ready to run, then you copy the file onto Linux, and then you use the command line to compile it. So let's see how we would actually do that. So C is a, a high-level compiled programming language, but at the same time, it's kind of close to the, to the hardware. So it's high, but not too high. Um, so uh, you have uh, symbols and syntax. Uh, you can read it, you don't have to like uh, interpret it in some weird way, it's not like machine format. Uh, it actually has, you know, it's written basically in English. You can look at it and kind of guess if you don't know what C is, what is, uh, what is going on. Uh, but uh, it is at the same time compiled, meaning that there is a, 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 a tool that would read in this text and translate it into something that the machine understands without much thinking. Okay, so that's what compilation means. Translation from human readable format to machine readable format. So machine readable format means humans won't really get it, will be a bunch of gibberish. Uh, and this is the file that you execute, this is the file that you run, this is the file that you put after dot slash in order to um, see what your program will output. So let's take a look at the very first very very simple example uh, with a simple code that I placed into this location project slash e20271, which remember uh, we have created softlink4, which is uh, phi352. Um, and then there is a subdirectory of that that's called share. So, what are we going to do? We're going to go into projects e20271 slash student. Uh, you can create your own subdirectory in there. Uh, you can copy. Uh, into your working directory here. Notice it's not a home directory, it's uh, a directory where you can put big files. Um, you copy from lecture one hello.c and uh, you can take a look at what is that hello.c and you can compile hello.c 
uh, by typing gcc hello.c minus o hello.exe so minus o means output so this is the file that you compile and this is the file that comes out uh, this is the result of the compilation of the executable and then you can run it by typing dot slash the name of the execu executable in this case hello.exe and not surprisingly you're going to get hello world uh, so that is what it is and of course I didn't go into the details but this is what the contents of the file look like uh, which we will not dwell on uh, for the moment uh, I really recommend to check out this tutorial on how to use C language uh, www.learn-c.org uh, Python uh, a super amazing tool that can create fantastic very visually attractive plots uh, perform data analysis um, Python you can think of it as uh, a high-level language that is interpreted so it doesn't get compiled um, so every line gets interpreted in real time but it has a lot of powerful libraries which are compiled so if you want to run one tool take its output and put it into the other tool and then take its output and plot it this is what Python will do every time there is a uh, computational intensive operation um, then it will make a library call and uh, then it will get the output that then you can give it to another library call and so on so that's what Python is really good at it's kind of this uh, spider in the middle of the spider web and has access to all of the of these uh, nicely compiled tools which are really fast and kind of the centralized place kind of centralized uh, uh, terminal <laughs> where you you can have access to all of those uh, libraries in a centralized location so let's try and uh, see how to install it uh, the easiest way to do that is to download the Anaconda distribution just like we discussed during the office hours and uh, it has so many pre-built compiled packages for plotting for solving ordinary differential equations for symbolic uh, solutions of equations uh, you name it uh, here is an example of what you can do uh, with Python how to make a simple plot so uh, you start uh, Python um, by typing ipython minus minus pylab minus minus pylab is uh, uh, instructing uh, python that uh, it needs to be ready for some pretty plots um, then you import a few of those uh, compiled libraries these are the fast libraries that can crunch the data and plot things uh, we're in importing numpy uh, as a shorthand np so we don't have to type numpy every time we just need to type two characters nmp we're importing matplotlib so numpy works with numbers like arrays and so on matplotlib is uh, a matlab analog uh, for python um, uh, so basically if you use matlab matplotlib will be pretty similar and this is what is driving uh, these beautiful plots then suppose that we would like to plot uh, temperatures in Chicago um, as a function of day of the year uh, so what you do here is you load uh, the table which is sitting in this text file which you can either copy uh, from uh, the shared data uh, on uh, the Quest supercomputer or you can get this file from Canvas and uh, uh, there are four columns in this file uh, the first one is day the second one is high the third one is average and the fourth one is low uh, temperature of the day uh, and uh, if we want to plot the average temperature of the day versus the day then this is what we do plot scatter scatter plot of temperature versus day and that is precisely what you're going to get so the days range from uh, 0 all the way up to uh, 364 uh, and this is a temperature in obviously Fahrenheit otherwise uh, Chicago would be boiling in the summer although to be fair it is boiling uh, in the summer uh, you can also uh, plot several uh, of the scatter plots on the same plot and you can add a legend that tells you which uh, color of points 
represents uh, which type of data. Uh, so here we do the same sort of preamble, uh, reading the file the same way, uh, but when we plot, we can add an extra argument that tells uh, how to label uh, this particular data set. And you can use LaTeX uh, notation over here if you've used it. If not, look it up. I'm happy to tell you more and point you to the literature. And uh, in order to uh, show the legend, you type plt.legend. And this is all that you need in order to produce this really uh, beautiful plot. There are so many other things that you can do. You can add labels along the axis, you can change the fonts, you can change the, the, uh, the size of the symbols and the color of the symbols depending on the value. You can do a lot of exciting, exciting things um, that I will not be covering here. There is a lot of information uh, on the Matplotlib website. Go over here, there is a whole gallery uh, with the code that generates each of these beautiful images. You can copy and paste the code, play around with it, and learn by example. Python is a great language, intuitive, that you can easily learn by example, and that's what I've done um, when I was learning myself. Uh, hopefully, that might work out for you as well. GNUplot is an older tool that many people still use. Uh, it is uh, well supported and documented. It's driven by commands uh, from the command line, but you can also uh, do that by creating scripts. Uh, this is not my personal favorite, but if you want to really quickly look at the contents of a text contents of a text file, it's unbeatable. So let's take a look at uh, what it is really briefly. So the latest table release on Quest is 504. Uh, it keeps changing. Overall, I would say that the functionality stays roughly the same. So if you're viewing this lecture a few years down the road, and right now it's January 13th, 2021, uh, numbers can, could have changed, but most of the functionality stayed likely the same. Uh, you can uh, uh, get the binaries from here, and the documentation of the latest stable version currently is sitting over here. So how to use that? Well, you can uh, either uh, type in a shell or you can create a file for it. Um, there is too much to cover, so we will be looking at the simplest examples to get started. So this is the same example that we used for plotting using Python, but now we're going to be using that uh, in GNUplot. So uh, this is the location of the file. Um, you can also get it in Canvas and uh, this is what the file contains. Uh, the first one is the day, and the second, third, and fourth columns are the temperatures, high, average, and low, like we discussed uh, previously. So uh, here is how you can make the same plot that we did in Python, uh, but uh, using GNUplot. So first of all, you uh, run GNUplot by typing GNUplot, which is not a surprise, right? Uh, and then here, what you will do is you will uh, type plot, uh, give the full path to the file in quotes, and you will say using, and then you will put the x uh, column index, uh, column uh, y column index, and you can uh, label it by uh, uh, using the keyword title uh, and then uh, uh, labeling it with whatever you want. Uh, so one is the first column, uh, the day, and the third column uh, will be the average temperature. And so that's precisely what you're going to get. If you want to plot several things, then this is how you do that. Uh, you type plot, uh, the file name, uh, using, uh, title, and then uh, you put here a column, I think, if I remember right. See, I'm not using the plot, so it's a bit hard for me to tell. Uh, and then you're giving the same file name using 1, 2, so that will be the high temperature, and then there will be 1, 4, uh, let's see, 1, 4 over here, yes, and then there will be low temperature. So that's what uh, you are going to do. So uh, it's good for quick uh, plotting, but as you can see, uh, this actually is much harder to read than that really clean uh, notation that we were using uh, in Python, where uh, you have this really nice breaking down of complex commands into like really small uh, and nicely separated individual uh, commands. So that is why I prefer Python. If you ever want to go back and see what have I done, uh, a Python script is much easier to read and understand. Um, 
So what are we going to be doing in the next lecture? We're going to look in more details of the scene language. We're going to look at the variables, how to input uh, data from files and write uh, to files, how to decide what to do if then else, and how to create arrays that store the data. Um, take a look uh, at what uh, we have gone over today before the next office hours on Thursday. Uh, try and see if you can understand what's going on in the lecture and whether you can reproduce uh, these, uh, um, uh, these examples that we have covered here. Uh, and uh, if you are interested in more reading, you can look at Practical C uh, book, uh, these chapters in it, or take a look at learn-c.org learn for a really useful uh, tutorial uh, on uh, the C language.